about these fusion rings or Valinde algebras. So in the talk today they will come from quantum groups, so uh, certain tensor categories from UQG. This is mainly going back to a construction of Anderson, Henning or Anderson, by taking the Gordon de group of this. But you can also get it from very different aspects, for instance, from, from conformal field theory, uh, by just looking at spaces of con conformal blocks. So given an affine Katz Moody Lie algebra, uh, so these are some spaces depending on three weights, lambda, mu, nu, and Verlinde constructed an algebra by taking the dimension of this space and send this to the structure constant of this algebra. So the other aspect which I briefly want to mention is you can also construct it from affine Katzmodili algebras by looking at the representations at a fixed level. So this is uh, Finkelberg and Kastan and Lustig. And also from twisted K-theory, so this is more from the topology side. Uh, so this is free Hopkins Telemann. And finally, the last one I want to mention is when you want to construct three manifold invariants. And I mentioned uh, Reshe Tikin and Turalf. So they all talk about this thing. So today I want to completely focus on the aspect from quantum groups. But uh, these other aspects come in by looking at certain roots of unities, uh, which I will comment on a bit later. So let me now start by putting the setup. So G is a simple complex Lie algebra. Or GLN, C. And I fix the corresponding Cartesian matrix, C. And very important will be the following number D. So D is the maximum of the absolute values of the off-diagonal uh, matrix entries in the Cartan matrix. So V is equal to 1, 2, or 3, depending if you are in tab ADE, BCF, or G. OK, what else do I need for any root alpha? I define D alpha to be the number, the scaling where I take the square length of alpha divided by 2, which is normalized such that uh, the alpha is 1 if alpha is short. So again, these numbers are just either 1, 2, or 3, and the maximum of it is just the D. OK, so uh, if you put them in a matrix, uh, the alpha 1, so the one corresponding to the simple root, is exactly the symmetrizing matrix which we had in the first talk of the conference. So and on this data, I can define uh, uq of g, lustix divided power quantum x. So it depends on q, and q is a primitive else root of unity. So I definitely don't want to assume that Q is uh, L is odd. Uh, so I want to look at the cases which usually people distinguish, uh, L even or L odd. And I define L primed 
to be L if L is odd and L half if L is even. Okay. Good. Uh, so usually, usually one would look as an algebraic at the odd cases and ignore the even cases. It's mostly because one is interested in having connections to uh, to uh, algebraic groups in positive characteristic, and the characteristic, which is then the L, is usually a prime number. So we get odd. But for this talk, I really want to under, uh, to distinguish two cases, which are slightly different from even and odd, namely case one and case two, where the case one is D divides not this L prime, or D divides L prime. So, and I, I claim that the first guy, this is what usually algebra is look like, look at, or maybe at the extreme case of these things. And this thing is what, what I would say physicists, anthropologists would prefer. And I want to put them together because I want to understand a little bit their interplay. So now let's look at rep <coughs> UQG. So finite dimensional representations of UQG. And therefore uh, each lambda an integral weight, so x is the integral weight, I have a dual value module, which is just the induced module of the one dimension module for B, for the ball, uh, induced up. So by inducing, I mean just taking homes. And then uh, of this guy, the finite dimensional part. So let's just take f, or maybe put f in the front. So it's the maximal finite dimensional submodule. And then the dual of it uh, is this guy. So these are the dual, respectively, y module. So that's the dual, and that's, no, that's the dual, and that's the y module. Okay, so these are all objects in there. Uh, and how do I construct now this tensor category? I take modules which have filtrations by these guys, by both while and dual while modules. These are called tilting modules. And look at the corresponding additive category. So definition, T, an object in this rep UQ is tilting. if it has a delta and a nabla flat. OK. So now uh, a general uh, result building on work of Ringel and Duncan, and then proved, I guess, in this situation by Anderson, uh, is that these tilting modules uh, decompose into a direct sum of indecomposables. And the indecomposables are classified by dominant integral weight uh, by just saying these guys are only non-zero if lambda is dominant integral. And then this is a unique indecomposable which has a delta flag starting with delta lambda at the bottom. So this is an indecomposable tilting module. And these are exactly all the ones. So then the first theorem, which I think goes back to Paradovsky and then Lustig. So uh, what does it say? Tiltings from an additive uh, ribbon tensor category. So an important to note here is, so uh, ribbon means we have dual objects, and tensor means we can tensor together and then it's closed. So a tensor product of two tiltings is again a tilting. And this was proved for uh, the root of unity being odd by Paradovsky using 
uh, methods from algebraic groups. And I think this proof does not work for even roots of unity. And then Lustig use canonical basis to do it in general. And uh, so I, I think one should really uh, take Lustig proof to, to, in particular, cover the cases which are interest of interest for the physicists. So for instance, if you do John Simon theory coming from Witten, you would be always in this case and not in the case where the algebra is usually work. OK, now, uh, of course, this, this labeling set is infinite. We want to have a, a smaller category, which has finitely many objects. And okay. yeah? the, the content of that is that it's closed under duals. Is that the hard it's part? No, closed under duals is easy, but closed under tensor products is difficult. That's the part that That's you the could use. Yes. Kind of yeah. And where Paradovsky passes to algebra groups. Yeah. OK, uh, so what I do now is tensor, uh, quotient out the tensor category. Um, I define a tilting module to be negligible. If and only if the quantum dimension is 0. So I don't want to define what the quantum dimension is, uh, but it's an abstract categorical dimension, which uh, is possible to define for any ribbon category. So what you do is you take the ribbon element, which in this case is the Cartan element k to the power 2 rho, and you look at the trace of this multiplication with this element restricted or applied to t lambda. And this should be 0. This is what is defined to be quantum dimension 0. Uh, and it's an abstract result of tensor categories that if you take this categorical dimension, then it defines a tensor category, uh, an ideal in this tensor category. And so I can define the quotient of, so I should have called this tensor category T, and I can take the quotient T negligible, which I define as T quotient out by the negligible object. So this is the category which has the same objects as T, so just direct sums of indecomposable tilting modules, and I quotient out all morphisms which factor through a negligible guy. And so the claim is, except from except of the case of GLN, this is a finite semi-simple tensor category. And I'm interested in understanding what is labeling the symbols. And for this, I introduce the following so-called fundamental Alkov. <coughs> so it's just a set of weights. So it's all integral dominant weights, uh, such that a certain condition holds. So they pair with a certain root, uh, when I add with rho, uh, smaller than this L prime, or if you want to work with co roots, which I usually prefer, lambda plus rho paired with theta zero check is smaller than L prime divided by this d theta, which I defined here. So, what is this theta zero check? So, theta zero check depends on whether I'm in case one or in case two. So it's the maximal short root, denoted theta short, or it's the maximal long root, denoted like this, depending whether I'm in case one or <coughs> in case two. So and this is some sort of indication that we, in one case, work with the sort of root lattice, and the other case, we work with the co-root lattice. So these are some sort of Langlands dual shadow which comes up here. So it looks technical, but one should really think of they live on two sides of some, or should live in on two sides of Langlands duality. So this is just a set of weights. Uh, and it defines an Alkov for some affine y group. So it's a fundamental dof domain of an affine y group action. Uh, so here's the proposition 
which says something about this. So part of it is in a paper, a very nice paper of Sabine, and then the rest is in a joint work of my students, Daida and myself. Um, so first thing is, if lambda is not in this Alkov, uh, then T lambda is negligible. And second, if it's in this Alkov, or if I run two elements in this Alkov, <coughs> then they form a basis of the Gordon degree of this tensor category. So and it's finite, except of in the case of GLN, in GLN you you have you pair here something which involves lambda one and lambda n and you just have to look at the difference. So you get infinitely many in this case, but otherwise finitely many. So and the third thing is is an easy observation, but I think it helps a little bit to understand the picture. Uh, this fundamental Alkov is a fundamental domain for affine y group and it describes the linkage principle for these tilting modules. Uh, so the y group is of the following form. It's a semi-direct product with the finite y group. So w is the finite y group with uh, L primed times q or L primed times q check. So this is in case one, and this is in case two. And you see there is a difference here, just a little check there in contrast to here. So here this is the group which usually comes up in representation theory of algebraic groups, like in Janssen's book. And here is the affine y group which you usually see when you look in books on affine katsumudi lie algebras, and they are not the same. In particular, you should not just put them together. Okay? And so I want to I want to emphasize it has nothing to do with even and odd, it has to do with this sort of division property case one and case two. Okay, so uh, so we now know what the size of this of this fusion ring is, and it's same is simple. So what I want to understand now is what does what does this K0 <coughs> look like as a ring? <coughs> so and I first want to say something about the uh, easy case of GLN and uh, then go to the, to the general case. So I define now A to be K0 of T negligible <coughs> and I call this the fusion algebra. So it's an algebra over integers with a distinguished basis given by these classes of the tetics. So let me first look at the case where G is GLN. So this is a well-studied case, uh, but let's, let's start with this one. So there's a theorem which for me was really the motivation uh, originally to look at all this, uh, which goes back to Witte. And then it was also, it was proved mathematically by Agni Hotri in a thesis, which however I haven't seen. So if anybody has this, I still would like to see it. Uh, and then I proved it with Christian Korf in a, in a paper much later, namely that in case of GLM, this fusion ring can be realized geometrically as quantum cohomology of some Grossmannian. <coughs> Namely, I take Grossmannians of n dimensional subspaces, this is this n, in L, where L is my order of the root of unity. Uh, so, and this is the small quantum group. And I have no idea how. how uh, Witten really came up with this. So I, I, it's a long paper and I can only catch some of the, of the ideas in there. But I think what is really striking for me is, is the similarity between the multiplication in A 
using conformal blocks and the dependence on three weights. And on this side, three point comb of Witten invariance, which give the multiplication in this quantum cohomology ring. So, and what is the Q? The Q on this side is a parameter, just a formal parameter. On this side, it corresponds to the determinant web station. And this isomorphism of rings <coughs> sends a standard basis <coughs> vector given by a tilting to a corresponding Schubert glass on that side. So it's the most natural thing you can imagine. Again? What, what are the words? Small, 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 small. Uh, small. <laughs> Sorry, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Too many quantum groups. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, so uh, just to give you a flavor of this ring. So in general, uh, one can always write it a as a quotient of a polynomial ring, and in type A. This, I think, goes really back to Verlinde, although he would not write it in this way. But then, if you, if you work on this side, it's Siebert and Tian. And it says that A is isomorphic as a ring to the following. You look at elementary symmetric functions in E1 and Vn. So these are elementary symmetric functions. Of polynomials, you add a variable q and you factor out an ideal. And this ideal can be given explicitly. I'll just write it down. Uh, like this. So these are the complete symmetric functions. So it looks like this, uh, where k is such that h l is equal to n plus k. So I want to emphasize two things here. So one thing is you should really think of these things as symmetric polynomials, which is the same thing as characters for GLN. Uh, so a is a quotient of characters, which makes sense because somehow <laughs> Uh, these tilting modules involve characters of these Y modules. And the second thing which I want to mention is that it's very well known that this quantum cohomology is a semi-simple ring. And many people studied it uh, using, for instance, integral persistence methods. So and this is also how Christian Kauf and myself proved this isomorphism. We used integral persistence methods. So let me just state this quickly. So the main point is to understand this ring, it's enough to understand the spectrum of the ring. And the spectrum uh, is somehow uh, simple. So and what we did is the following. We constructed a simultaneous eigenbasis. Uh, for the action of these generators E1 up to En. On this ring. And so you can call this either gelfand settling basis, like in Ben's talk, or you can call this a BT algebra basis, or BT basis, because we did this uh, using some integrable systems model. So this integrable systems model, I don't want to explain this, but it's called a friendly workhorse in the literature. And uh, uh, yeah, I don't want to get into this. But what I want to say is there is a very nice gelfand settle or BT basis, which comes from diagonalizing an action of E1 up to En. And the ring is a quotient of a polynomial ring. Okay. Um, so 
the fact that this guy is a basis uh, has to do that if you take a base change matrix, this base change matrix is invertible. So and this base change matrix has a meaning So this is an S matrix in the, in the literature of conformal field theory or tensor categories. So what is an S matrix? So if I think in terms of not or link invariance, and I look at this guy, I just have to be able to draw it like this. I oriented like that. So this is a picture when I label it with tilting modules, T lambda and T mu. This is a picture of an endomorphism from my ground field to my ground field by just saying I start from my identity. Then I go to T lambda tensor, T lambda dual, tensor T mu, tensor T mu dual. I swap the middle two terms twice, and then I pair it. So this gives me an endomorphism from the identity to the identity. I evaluate at one, and this gives me a number. So that means for each of these lambda mu, I get a number as lambda mu, and then s is defined to be the matrix uh, which has labels lambda mu in my fundamental Lyapkov, like this. And this is an element, so the entries are in CQ, uh, 1 divided by L, uh, and describes the base change matrix. So, category, the category. yeah, exactly. And so the point, the fact that this beta basis exists, and so it says that this thing is invertible, and this is a non-trivial non fact. So tensor categories such that this S matrix is invertible are called modular. So what I get here is a modular tensor category. Or maybe I should not say I get this, but this is what is behind it. Is it obvious that A should be trivial when N is larger than L? Uh, when N is larger than and the Grassmannian is empty. Then what should be trivial is A L. What should be trivial? Uh, uh, and it's L L in So uh, uh, okay. it's N in L. So this is somehow uh, N dimensional subspaces in here and it's a co dimension. Uh, okay. Oh, yes, I should, have, I should have said this, but if you look at the definition of this fundamental I curve AL, then it's empty if this is not true, and then everything collapses. OK. So, uh, and for people who know modular tensor categories, if you, come, if you have a modular tensor category, then you always have for free uh, an SL2 action on the corresponding Gordon degree. So coming from this, what you get is an SL2 set action. Yeah, I should say SL2 set action on uh, the corresponding K0 of T negligible. Where this S is, so, so SL2 set has generators, has standard generators S and T. And so this S, this corresponds to the S matrix. And this T corresponds to a ribbon element, roughly. So I don't want to, to write too many formulas, but this is the idea. So that means this uh, sort of nice behavior with this extra basis comes from this nice behavior of the modular tensor category. So now, what is? I want to say, uh, I want to go back to a philosophy of Chewetnik. So I call it a philosophy because it's, it's, if you read his book, it's somehow written there, but not explicit. But I think it's fair to somehow call it like this. So Chewetnik's philosophy is, uh, any Verlinde algebra is a 
a representation of a double affine Hecke algebra. So now <laughs> I put this Verlinde algebra in quotations because when you look at Chavetnik's book, he defines the notion of an abstract Verlinde algebra, but he never checks that our algebras are actually abstract Verlinde algebras. And so if I look at GLN, then it's not, because one of the properties of his abstract Verlinde algebra is it's, it's finite dimensional, and GLN is not, because we have this determinant representation. That's about the, this Q, it's infinite dimensional. But another thing which he wants to have is definitely this SL2 Z action. So, and it's, uh, I think, not an obvious fact that these Verlinde algebras have an uh, obvious SL2 Z action, because we have to check that these categories are modular. Okay. And then it's also not clear which Daha should act. And uh, if you ask Javetnik, it's uh, somehow, of course, uh, he would tell you immediately some conditions which Daha. But I, I don't think that this is somehow, apart from small cases like SL2, this is more uh, made rigorous. And so then the next part of the talk is to somehow make this a little bit rigorous. OK, so I should, I should define what the Daha is. So double affine Hecke algebra. Let's go back to Chevetnik. So what is it? So if I have G and any choice of a lattice, between the root lattice, say Q, oh, maybe I should. I should not use too many letters. So between the root lattice and the weight lattice, Chevetnik defines a double affine Hecke algebra. And so I call this H with two lines. It depends on two parameters, Q and T. And then it depends on G and L. And for us, L will always be uh, the weight lattice. OK. So now, uh, I want to give you the, the definition. But before I do this, uh, I roughly say how it looks like. Uh, yes, yes. So it's a bit cheating. It's, uh, let me say it in a second. Yes. Uh, so um, if you haven't seen Daha, I want to say it's isomorphic as a vector space. To uh, the group algebra of the weight lattice, x tends out a finite Hecke algebra. So that's a finite Hecke. Hands up with the group algebra of the dual weight lattice. And then I have a parameter which also should come in. And maybe I should put a Q tilde because I shouldn't mix it up with my quantum Q. OK, so uh, the easiest case to get a feeling where this algebra comes from is the case where I take G to be SL2 and I take as my lattice, I take Z plus Z i inside C. And on C, I have an action of Z mod 2 Z just by sending x to minus x. So what you can do, you can look at the corresponding elliptic curve given by this, by this lattice. So E is the elliptic curve given by this lattice. I remove the zero point, which is fixed under this uh, Z2 action. Um, and then I take uh, 
So E minus the zero point is this. And then I take the fundamental group of this E minus the zero point, modulo this set mod two set actually, so overfold fundamental group. And the group algebra of this projects onto this star for a set two. So and this subjection is given just by quotient out in a quadratic relation where I take here a certain generator and I quotient out the quadratic relation. So everything depends on this parameter t and I quotient this out. So now you might ask where does the q come in? So the q is hidden and it's, I really don't want to say much about it because it's a bit annoying. So what is, where the q comes in is that you actually act on an affine weight lattice and not a finite weight lattice. You have an imaginary root and so you work always with integral weights. So the coefficient in front of imaginary root is an integral number. And instead of writing the imaginary root, you write q to this number. So and this is where the q comes in. So it's really nothing which one should understand at this point. Uh, but what, what one should understand is that this daha naturally comes from a construction which generalizes the usual break group and its group algebra. So and if you want to see what it is in type A, you can see explicit generators and relations. There's Ti's running between 0 and n. So if you would take Ti going from 1 to n, you would have a finite Hecke algebra. And here are the finite Hecke algebra relations, the quadratic relation and the braid relations. Then you have an extra lattice given by the weight lattice. And you just multiply like in the, in the weight lattice. Um, and then you have some interaction between the, the t's and the x's. This is very similar to an affine uh, Hecke algebra, like this and this, depending on whether lambda and the alpha i check pair to 1 or 0. And then you have an extra uh, contribution by the fundamental group, so the weight lattice model root lattice. If you take an element from there, you have relations like the pi's from, from here. You have relations of this form uh, with the t's and the x's. And so all together, you can say you have a finite Hecke algebra. Together with this axis, you have an affine Hecke algebra. Or you can take the 0 and the ti, so this, all the ti's, together with the pi. This gives you the other copy of affine Hecke algebra. There's two affine Hecke algebras glued together in this star. Okay? And this is some sort of a PVW statement. Good. So if we have this, there is a natural web station coming from it. So what you can do is you can view this part here, somehow like a Borel in this Daha. And you can define the polynomial web station. To be the induced web station, the triple web station for this affine Hecke algebra induced up. So this is h depending on q tilde and t tensored over this p with the triple web station. And this is isomorphic as a vector space to this. And if you want for GLN, this is isomorphic to a Laurent polynomial ring. in n nervous. OK, so now what I want to do, I want to specialize these parameters. And what is the idea behind it? These double affine Hecke algebras were invented by Chevetnik, for instance, in, in, uh, 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 to, to solve McDonald's positivity conjectures, so and in relation to McDonald polynomials, which come with two parameters, q and t. But we want to work with this Verlinde algebra, which really only involves characters. So we want to specialize q and t to some value so that they disappear. And I want to do this now. I want to set q tilde to be t to be e to the pi i divided by l. So this is my l's root of unity which comes in. And then I abbreviate my double r find f algebra. Q tilde t just as 
H because now my Q tilde and T is specialized. Okay, so now I have this, I have this uh, natural action of my double affine Hecke algebra on this polynomial web station, and I'm almost happy. This looks like characters, except that I have this plus minus, and they are not symmetric. So I better symmetrize them. And to symmetrize them, I introduce a symmetrizing element E. So that's a symmetrizing element. In the, alpha, in the finite Hecke algebra inside H. So you just take the sum over all elements in the finite Hecke algebra with some t powers in front, uh, given by t to the length of the element, and this gives this symmetrizing element. So and if you normalize it correctly, it gives you an item potent, and you can check under this condition here, it really makes sense, it gives an item potent. And this defines you a spherical double affine Hecke algebra. Just by taking an item potent truncation from of the original algebra. And then of course, this spherical daha acts on E times the polynomial web state. So what is E times polynomial web stations? E times polynomial web stations, I, I symmetrize these things. And what I claim, this is what you guess it is, namely symmetric Lorentz polynomials. So here's the theorem. OK, first, it's pretty easy. E times this polynomial web station as a vector space is just the weight lattice, or the group algebra of the weight lattice, taking y group invariants. So you get really invariant Laurent polynomials in this GLN case. Second, so when you look at Daha web stations, the nice ones are always quotients of polynomial web stations. So the idea is to uh, construct nice web stations as quotients of this E times polynomial web station for the spherical Hecke algebra. And indeed, what you can do, you can take E polynomial, and you can define a certain bilinear form on here, which I don't want to introduce, but it's a very standard form which Cherednik always uses. You can define the radical of this form multiplied by E. And this gives a web station of this spherical double affine Hecke algebra, and it's irreducible. And this is for any type, not only for type A. Uh, number three, M decomposes <laughs> into one-dimensional eigenspaces for this other part. So here is, here is still a polynomial log or polynomial part. Uh, and so it decomposes for this part into one-dimensional eigenspaces. And so what we have now, we have a quotient of symmetric polynomials or Laurent polynomials on which spherical Daha acts. And we have a nice eigenspaces, eigenbasis with respect to an action of this commutative algebra. And this looks very much like the thing we had, which we had at the beginning. So for any type of G, you always specialize your T. Yes. Um, yes. Oh, I should have said something about the TIs. I promised this to <laughs> So in fact, so I was cheating. It doesn't depend only on T and Q. It depends on Ti's and Q. And what are the Ti's? So you have two root lengths at most. And the, you have corresponding to each root length, you have a T. So there's uh, either one or two parameters T. Um, so the formulas here depend on it. But 
this this t is don't don't depend. So this is for all t. I think I got confused about what this c bracket pi comma e minus. This one? Okay, this means you take you take this elliptic curve minus the zero point. Yeah. <laughs> you let z mod two z on it act, and you just take the overfold fundamental group. Oh. And this is a group, and you take the group algebra, oh. and the group algebra is somehow oh, right. uh, has a quotient which is the dark. Oh, okay. So in the formulas, the, the different t alphas come in, but not in the specialization. This is the same for every, all of them. So for instance, also in the eigenvalues, uh, it comes in. This is, a, this is a very explicit group. Yes. I can explain you afterwards what it is. <laughs> or you can think what Daha SL2 is, and then you see it as well. <laughs> okay, uh, so and let me, let me state number four. So, so far, what, is what I don't have yet is any connection to our Verlinde algebra. So and here's the first connection to our Verlinde algebra. If g is equal to gln, that is now important, uh, then we had this explicit <laughs> description of this Verlinde algebra as a quotient of this commutative ring. So I wrote quantum cohomology. Okay. So now I can take this and embed this without a Q into uh, here, which is Leroy polynomials, symmetric Leroy polynomials. But the Q is somehow bad, so I want to specialize Q to 1, and I want to specialize Q to 1. So in, in terms of quantum cohomology, I just count all the curves and I ignore degrees. And the statement is, when I see this now as E times polynomial, and I look here at E times radical, and look at here the quotient M, then this inclusion induces inclusion here and induces an isomorphism there. So this is an isomorphism of vector spaces with distinct eigenbases. I mean, this base eigenbases which I constructed here via integrable systems and here via Chavet negation. Okay, so this is nice. So this connects nicely. So now we want to do it in other types. So in the other types, there is a problem because it doesn't work in general. <coughs> and uh, and here I realize that the uh, that uh, topologists and physicists are right. They sh we should look at different roots of unity. So if, if we are in case 2, so this was the case where d divides our L prime. So in particular, this is far away from L being an odd root of unity. Uh, then my Verlinde algebra A is isomorphic to P, to M as vector space. And uh, the multiplication of symmetric Laurent polynomials describes uh, the multiplication A. 
So we are in case G2, and G is not GLN. So this is somehow covered by this. So G is now simple. So I claim if we are in case 2, then this Verlinde algebra, which I denoted A, is isomorphic to this M as a vector space. And when I act with my Daha, uh, then I get exactly back the multiplication of A. So acting with a symmetric Laurent polynomial describes for me multiplication in my Verlinde algebra. But I need this assumption case two. So and uh, in general, what happens in general? <laughs> so if we are in case one, Then uh, we have always a subjection of these symmetric polynomials onto M, uh, onto uh, wait, uh, I don't want to write this. Then uh, Daha acts, so spherical Daha acts, acts on A. And A is always a quotient of this E poly. But it might be, it might be bigger. It might be bigger and might have higher dimensional eigenspaces. So in general, this nice property that it decomposes into one dimensional eigenspaces, this is true for M, but it's not necessarily true for A, which we can realize as a quotient of E poly. And we, we were calculating in which cases does it happen, and we got a weird list. So and then uh, we found luckily a paper by Savin, who bigger than, bigger than M. Second? Bigger than, than what? Bigger than one. The eigenspaces have dimension bigger than one. Oh, might be bigger than M, yes. Yes, you are totally right. So, uh, so there is a paper by Savin who studies modularity of tensor categories coming from tilting modules. And he has a list depending whether L is odd, which is here the first line, and whether L is even, this is the second line. So if you look in the case L even, you get problems for modularity for B and C. But then if you look in which case it occurs, it occurs if D does not divide L prime, if D does not divide L prime. So if we are in the cases which the physicists and topologists like, it's modular. And in these cases, these eigenspaces are exactly one dimensional. Whereas if we have problems on the modularity, we don't have this one dimensionality. Okay? Uh, and it, it, it happens in the even case sometimes, but it never happens in this case two, which we have here. Okay? And if you look at L odd, you see there's much more problem cases. And this tells you the L odd case is from a model or tensor category point of view is, I think, really bad. And also from the, from the point of view of, of Daha, web station is bad. So and what you see in this list, in this list of, of Savin, is it gives you some weights, which are always fundamental weights, which he list, lists here. And what he calculated is symmetries of the S matrix. So he asked the question, when are two eigenvalues are uh, two, two columns in the S matrix linearly dependent. And he, he, he checked that if a weight differs from another weight by uh, a translation of by these fundamental weights, then this is the case. 
So what this means for us is that our affine y group, which describes the linkage principle, is too small. We should make it bigger, make a, our fundamental group, uh, fundamental I curve smaller. And then we get a space which has this dimension. And this is then supposed to be the coordinate group of the correct modular tensor category. And let me just finish with two remarks which go in this direction. So remark. So that the first thing I only just say in words, this dimension bigger than one exactly appears if the corresponding tensor category is not modular. The second remark is there is a natural SL2Z action on the Staha model M just because there is a natural SL2Z action on Dahas and then you can deduce it on the uh, spherical Daha and then you have it here and then you have it here. So that in particular, in the good cases, we have an SL2Z action on this Valinde algebra. And then I should mention a result by Fougier, Fougier um, from 2000. So he could construct modular tensor categories. as quotients of uh, our tensor categories, uh, which are modular, or maybe for the specialists more precisely spin modular, uh, with k0 isomorphic to this n in almost all the belt cases. Of course, he would not formulate it like this. Uh, he would just write the quotient category, and then he would somehow compare it with the tables from the topologies. But then if you compare these tables with our calculations, then you can match it with this irreducible representation of Daha. Yeah, and uh, I should, I should uh, finish then with by saying, what is the corresponding fundamental Eikhoff when I take, let me call it AL good, uh, I define it as being the old fundamental I curve which I had before, and I intersect it with all lambda in the weight lattice such that uh, lambda plus rho alpha I check is smaller than L prime half. So where these guys are the co roots. for the weights in the list. <coughs> so I take this list here. I have all these fundamental weights. I take the corresponding co root And then I make my fundamental I curve smaller by putting this extra condition. And this describes exactly the irreducible objects in this quotient category and is in bijection to a basis of this spherical irreducible module. And on there, you have an asset to set action, and it is, has these nice modularity properties. But you see, it's, it's, it's more complicated than in the even case, where, where, the thing, where the picture, I think, is much nicer. OK, I should stop here. Thanks.